This is Justin Schmidt. Yeah, my name is Justin Schmidt. He's an entomologist. And I'm an entomologist. I basically study stinging insects. He's been stung by a lot of insects. I've probably been stung at least a thousand times. He reviews insect stings the way a sommelier reviews wine. Pure, intense, brilliant pain, like walking over flaming charcoal with a three-inch nail embedded in your heel. Which insect was that? That's the bullet ant. This is his lab in Tucson. This is his harvester ant. This is his vinegaroon. This is his tarantula hawk. These are some more harvester ants in a park near his lab. He is the creator of the Schmidt Pain Scale. The Schmidt Pain Scale is basically a scale to rate the painfulness of stinging insects on a scale of one to four. A one would be a sweat bee. Two would be something like a yellow jacket wasp. The three would be something like a harvest ant. And a four would be a tarantula hawk. How bad is a four? Four is absolutely excruciatingly debilitating, incapacitating, just shuts you down. Just absolute sheer pain. There's just nothing you can really do about that. I don't think I'd want to be stung by a whole bunch of different fours. I, I don't think I could endure that for very long. Let's be clear. Justin Schmidt doesn't just go out and get stung on purpose. It's just that he's dedicated his life to studying, well... My passion is insects and stinging insects in particular. Yeah, I get stung, but that's, that's all just part of the passion. You know, that, that gives me data. You know, sting helps me in understanding what the insect's doing. And I get to be out in the sunshine and out in the rain, out in the environment, studying these magnificent, beautiful insects. It's just, just such a joy. I can't imagine anything I'd rather do more. Deep in the Himalayan mountains, about 80 miles outside of Kathmandu, the Bujang village takes part in a death-defying tradition all in the name of honey. Yo pali stone. stone But procuring this precious honey takes more than just strength. A team of honey hunters assembles twice a year to prepare, and Madan, he leads the pack. पहले यो जस्ते हमरा यो गाम चाहे जति खेरा यो गाम चाहे यहाँ हम सिस्टी भायो ते खेरे वड़ा यो गौरे को यो आने माना वो कती बने वो एक दिन आजा रहा बतेस ते था सहना ना दाय ना Today, ancient customs are still closely followed. Before each hunt, Madan must visit the village guru to receive his blessing. Guru बने वड़ा बुढ़ा भायो one day, Madan will fill the Guru's shoes. In the meantime, he leads his team of honey hunters into the jungle. The team braids and re-secures their handmade rope ladders. Then, they venture to the cliffside where the beehives are hiding. The team creates smoke fires down below to encourage the giant bees to scatter. Madan lowers himself onto the rope, dangling hundreds of feet from the ground. I was in the 
मैं वहाँ आक्रमण कर नमाऊ जस्तों लग् मैं अब एट बाध्यते मन भी पर्यटन मैं वहाँ से क्षमा मागे मैं मत Despite the incessant stinging on his unprotected skin, he calmly cuts away at the hive, fulfilling his duty and securing his liquid gold. Tatak kate on kate ra ab jati aaye pani tin se char se panch se kati cha se ab liter aunsa to liter jati pani. The hives are collected by the hunters and packed up to bring back to the village. Where their safe return is celebrated. Yoda mero janma diye ko din ma mero bhabi le yaan le yeh nidra ma lekhe oncha timle hani under gor nahi porsa. Yo mile yo yo kam gor mile ta ekdam ei shanti cha. Ye puron purone chalan bata ab purkhali bata ab yo mauri kan chalan chahi bakora cha. This is the dictator scorpion. Growing up to 8 inches in length, it is one of the largest scorpions in the world. For its colossal size, the dictator scorpion has relatively weak venom. So for defense, it resorts to its enormous claws. They help it to catch prey and ward off other scorpions. Located within the region of West Africa, the dictator scorpion is nocturnal. Spending most of its life underground, sometimes burrowing as deep as six feet. Unfortunately, size doesn't matter when it comes to the preservation of the dictator scorpion. With their natural habitats being destroyed by deforestation, its future is uncertain. This is the dictator scorpion. On the internet the other day, I found an animal that looks like something quite familiar. They've tried to block the road, but outside of the road, one share. Turns out, this fluffy-looking caterpillar that looks super soft is actually super poisonous. So I called Dr. Wagner. He's an entomologist up at UConn. My specialty is Lepidoptera, which is the study of butterflies and moths. This caterpillar. It has a few names. Well, it's Megalopygia percularis. Most people call this animal the puss caterpillar, except in the south, where many people call it the asp. These caterpillars are distinct because they're covered in what looks like long, soft hair. Only mammals have true hair, and then what we find on insects are really derived scales. Underneath those, it's where the poison spines are. They're maybe a little bit like a hypodermic needle. When you pet the caterpillar, it's quite a wallop. I think of all the caterpillars that sting, the asps may have the most painful and most toxic sting. That poison can cause headaches, swelling, nausea, blisters, even difficulty breathing. And in case you were thinking that these guys probably live deep in some jungle, you would be wrong. They're found mostly south of the Mason-Dixon line. On a research boat, usually it's the new guy who gets the dirtiest job. <laughs> you guys got spit on. This time is no exception. I'm Wes Larson, a wildlife biologist and lover of the outdoors for as long as I can remember. I'm traveling the country to find the next generation of conservationists, the people on the front lines of the fight to understand our planet and protect the animals we share it with. We got a pretty big hermit crab. <laughs> Today I'm headed to Sarasota on the Gulf Coast of Florida. It's home to a beautiful, but little understood animal, the spotted eagle ray. I'm joining up with the research team from Florida Atlantic University and Moat Marine Lab. They're some of the first scientists in the world to study this animal in depth. So Brianna, what are we doing today? So today we're gonna attempt to visually spot some spotted eagle rays, bring it on board, take a bunch of samples, and then we'll release it back into the wild. I'm way excited. 
Brianna DeGroote is a master's student at FAU. She's been obsessed with rays ever since she was 11 years old, and she's leading the field research today. Spotted eagle rays are pretty understudied. We really don't know a lot about them, right? Yeah, um, there's not a whole lot of information about just even their basic biology or ecology. So what do they mean for the environment? How are they affecting the environment? How many of them are out there? And from an environmental component, they're really important to keeping the ecosystem in balance. So it's really important that we understand basic questions about them, which is what we're trying to do here. We're up on the spotting tower. It's quite the view up here. You can definitely see into the water a lot better than you can down there. They stand out pretty good. We're gonna go over a grass bed right now. They have a tendency to hide in the grass. What we're looking for is a ray large enough to surgically implant a tracker. And it takes an experienced eye to spot one. Right there. An eagle ray? Yeah, I believe so. That's, Th that's him, that's him. Yeah. That's an eagle ray, dude. Be ready. Go, Matt. Catching a ray is a complicated maneuver. We have to completely encircle it with the net or the ray will escape. And you've got to be quick about it. The water's really choppy and these maneuvers that they do with the boat are really aggressive. You got him? Yeah, he's in there. You got him. Yeah. Once we've got it surrounded, we need to bring in the ray by hand. He's in the middle, he's going to the north. This ray turns out to be tiny, just a juvenile. My job is to hold it in place while the team does their work. And despite its size, it's not easy. Yeah, I can see how big one would be. Oh, pretty strong. Like, I'm going to go flip him. And flip him? Okay. As soon as we flip him over, you can really see how much he's calmed down. Uh, that's a state that they go into called tonic mobility. It's kind of like the ray's hypnotized. A lot easier to work with than when he, when he was on his belly. They get quite a bit bigger than this, right? Yes, they get to be about seven feet. I want to catch a seven foot ray today. We'll look for a seven foot ray. This ray is too small to surgically implant a tracking device. So once we've gathered what data we can, it's time to let him go. He's off in the wild. And while the spotters keep an eye out for a big ray, we take a break from the hunt. When you begin researching an animal, one of the most fundamental things to understand is its eating habits. And to figure out the eagle rays, the team has come up with a creative solution. We're going in, everybody in! Scouting area! So Brianna, this is kind of what we're looking for, right? That's exactly what we're looking for. And this is a gastropod? Yes. So or for the layman, a snail. Fancy name for a snail. snail. Okay. Yep, a marine snail. We take back the snails and clams to the lab, where the team has two wild rays in a holding tank. We're gonna put some fray items into the water, and we're going to record the sounds that they're making while they're crunching down on the hard shell prey items. And we're trying to decipher if these different prey items are making different signature sounds. By tracking the sounds that different shells make when the rays crunch them, the team believes that they can decipher the eagle ray's diet. And that's just, the big... Just crunched it there. Exactly, yep. But the hope is to put these listening stations out into the environment and we can know exactly what they're eating, when they're eating it, and how much they're consuming. As the captive rays crunch away, we get word that another has been spotted offshore. That's bigger! So it's time to head back into the Gulf for one last attempt to catch a big one. We just got word that there's another spotted eagle ray about double the size of the ones that we've currently been catching. So we're on our way to go relocate it and hopefully we'll get another ray on board. Get ready. Ready? Ready? It's pretty clear when the team grabs the other net that this is a much bigger ray. To your left. To your left. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. You guys ready? Nice and easy. You got enough water yet? Lift him all the all way, the way up, up. All the way up. All right, lower down. Perfect. A little bigger than the last one, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just a little bit. <laughs> it's unreal how strong their wings are. This ray is over five feet wide from wingtip to wingtip. Plenty big enough for the surgery Brianna is hoping to do. And my job? 
holding the ray upside down and perfectly still while she implants the tracking tag. So what you want is to like, yeah, like lay, figure out the best position for you to raise this part of her body up. So preparing all of our surgery supplies to do um, an internal acoustic surgery. It's a really quick procedure where an internal tag is implanted into their belly area and it allows us to follow their movements as they travel up and down the coastline. Is she going to react to this? She should. Ready? Yeah. If you start to feel her um, clench, just okay. let me know. I will. Sharks and rays don't feel pain the same way humans do. And with the ray on its back, it stays calm and relaxed throughout the procedure. Okay. Yeah, that was quick. You just did a good job. It's not bad. The surgery is over in just a few minutes. This tag will allow the team to track her for years to come, giving them a detailed picture of where eagle rays live and how far they travel, putting us one step closer to understanding this beautiful animal. I come from a mammal background, and working with mammals, there's kind of this natural connection that you have with them. And I didn't really expect to have that sort of connection with these rays, but when we pulled them up onto the boat, I felt this intelligence coming out of them. They're a very personable animal. Yeah, that's the reaction most people have. They're highly intelligent, and obviously their beauty and grace just helps us form another connection to them. I've heard people say there isn't much mystery left in nature but eagle rays remind me that there are still animals we know hardly anything about. Answering the basic questions can help us better understand them and in turn protect whole ecosystems. Watching this discovery firsthand was a true privilege and makes me wonder what other hidden secrets must be waiting out there.